it is really my honor uh, to have a chance to talk in this conference. And I'm really indebted to the society because uh, they brought me up uh, in this area. And also I'm so thankful to uh, Dr. Raymond Lowe, who shared a very wonderful talk. So actually you can skip this one because I, I think he covered most of uh, the important topics. The remaining part is not that important. And uh, thank you all, because this is a Saturday uh, and it is not easy to stay behind uh, for this kind of conversation. Thank you so much. So maybe I start off with the presentation. So you can all see the share screen. Um, this is a dimension that I want to bring out because a lot of time people start to ask questions like, what is the difference between palliative care? What is the difference between end-of-life care? And uh, I hope to give you an overview and that is, I summarize from a few uh, leading literature. And uh, in most of the country, they do think that advanced care planning can be started at any time, even when the person is healthy and it lies off. And uh, for someone diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, uh, they can, on one hand, receive curative uh, treatment, but at the same time, uh, so uh, when a person is expected to have a prognosis of less than 12 months, then it is the time for end-of-life care. Uh, that's why palliative care is start off much earlier than the end-of-life care. And then uh, in some places, they also introduce a concept called ICP, uh, which is the uh, integrated care priorities, uh, which is applied to the last few days or last few hours of life. And bereavement care also start before the death of the patient, but it extends uh, beyond the death of the patient. Uh, so what we are going to talk about uh, is more about the last 12 months of time. But as a backdrop, I will also highlight something related to palliative care. So the first question is, why community? So uh, it's more like a medical issues. Uh, it is about patient. So why we are talking about community? Then maybe we look at the challenge that we are facing currently. And uh, internationally, we expand the recipient of palliative care from cancer to other advanced illness. So uh, that means the potential population is expand quite large. And also, uh, Right now, we also expand the symptoms that we want to care from pain to other symptoms. And the aging population is something that is not uh, alien from anyone. And even for aging population, we had to take note that the composition of the family are also changing. A lot of families now become old, old family. And uh, we also expand our, our end of life care from the health to psychosocial and spiritual dimension. So all this uh, drive for a greater demand of palliative care and end of life care. Now, uh, I think some of you might have read this uh, global atlas of palliative care at the end of life. This is the first version uh, published in uh, 2014. And at that time, uh, Pickerson, Hickerson already highlight that not only cancer, but other forms of illness also require palliative care. And you can see the estimate percentage, uh, it is not a small number. And heart failure, renal failure, and uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are all included. And uh, Irene Hickerson actually did some calculation and globally, can you guess the number of potential recipients in a year of palliative care? And uh, they include children, they include adults. Now, if we only take into account for cancer patient, uh, it had about 6 million. And if we take into account of other diseases, and you can see it rose up even uh, two times. 
And eventually, if all are taking into account the children and the adult uh, advanced illness, and you can see in 2014, they actually estimate that uh, 20 million of individuals are in need of palliative care. Now, so you can imagine how our service, uh, in particular for those who only offer under the healthcare uh, system, be able to cover all the needs of the individuals. Now, I actually followed the uh, estimation formula uh, proposed by Irene Higginson and uh, taking into account 2018 in Hong Kong, we also have 28,000 uh, individuals who might be in need of palliative care. Now, then you can see uh, every year we have about uh, 48 to 50,000 people die and nearly more than half of them are in need of palliative care if we follow Irene Higginson definition. Now, but one thing that I need to highlight is two weeks ago, uh, the WHPCA actually published the second edition of the Global Atlas of Palliative Care. Now, more alarming is they even further expand the diagnostic group. Now in 2014, they include 18 uh, types of uh, diagnosis, uh, including cancer, but this time they expand to 20 and take a look at the 20, uh, they even include the low birth weight, premature birth uh, trauma, and also malnutrition. Now, so you can see, uh, I do think it is good to take into account the need of all the uh, groups. But at the same time, we have to think about uh, how much resources we have and how can we handle all the needs efficiently. Now, as you can see from the diagram, uh, this is from the uh, new uh, Global Atlas. And uh, aside from cancer, you can see that uh, for lung disease, uh, for heart disease, and for uh, degeneration CNS disease, uh, they all occupy a few uh, percentage. And uh, even though cancer is the dominating uh, recipient of palliative care, but they only uh, occupy about one quarter of it. Uh, I want to bring out some more attention in the, uh, uh, in the Global Atlas. They even include injury into the second edition uh, that is related to poisoning and external cause. Now, from the uh, logical perspective, people suffering from injuries in their final days, actually they have a lot of sufferings and also uh, a lot of uh, challenging symptoms. Uh, they are acute, uh, the family may be less prepared and the need of palliative care may even be much stronger. And they actually generate about 6.4% of the needs. And I hope you can also pay attention to this group, communicable disease. Now, right now we have COVID-19, we are affecting, today we have a, a, a larger number of cases and uh, many people around the world die of COVID. And it also uh, require our attention for the provision of COVID. And uh, you can see that uh, according to the WHPCA definition, uh, about one quarter also in need of communal, communicable disease. Now, uh, this is the uh, calculation from uh, the rate around the world, including uh, America, uh, Europe, and also Southeast Asia. Now, look at this one. Uh, this is for our Southeast Asia region. And I tried to do our calculation by using our population and uh, timing and the ratio. And it comes up with a huge number, 53,000 from their formula. So it actually exceeds the number of deaths in uh, 2018. So why this happened? Now, because the new uh, global atlas actually point out this key point, not only those who are dying within that 12 months are in need of palliative care. As you see from the earlier diagram, uh, 
whenever someone diagnosed with a incurable disease, uh, that is the start of the time when they are eligible for palliative care. Now, so you can see from their estimation, uh, it is not only those uh, who are going to die within a short time that is included. Actually, this group is smaller than those who had a longer time, longer life expectancy. Now, so this is another question for us. How should we uh, set the boundaries? Are we going to take in early intervention for this group? Uh, what are the benefits? Now, these are all questions that need to be addressed. And because of this calculation, you can imagine uh, the one who can receive palliative care will be uh, very little. And then uh, according to the 201 five estimation by the WHO, uh, about 86% of people who need have not received palliative care. Now, so you can see there is a big group. So what are we going to do? Now, but before we, we see how the solutions, we still need to look at the challenge. Now, Global Atlas Second edition, give us another challenge. Now in the past, uh, when they talk about suffering, they only link with one symptoms, which is pain. Now, but in the second edition, they follow the uh, Lancet Commission and expand uh, the symptoms from pain to 16. So that including anxiety worry, now which covered by uh, Dr. Raymond Lowe earlier on uh, to talk about the psychosocial spiritual needs, and then bleeding, confusion, constipation, diarrhea, dry mouth. Now I think for those who work in uh, palliative care, they find this no, uh, not a, a stranger. But if we include everything, then the population in need of palliative care will also be expanded. So as you can see, pain is only uh, occupying 14.4%, which is mild, and also 6.1%, which is uh, severe. So other four-fifths of the symptoms are not pain. And in particular, some of them are very difficult to tackle, like fatigue, weakness, uh, and also the psychological one, anxiety, depressed mood. Now, so you can now understand that uh, the expectation of provision of palliative care is not only dealing with the uh, physical pain, but also expanded to uh, psychosocial uh, symptoms. And at the same time, we also need to take care of some very absent symptoms like uh, fatigue and weakness. Now, another challenge we are facing uh, is the, is the uh, aging population. I, I think everyone is knowing that and uh, in 2030, I'm one of them already. Now, but one thing that we need to take note is it is not only the elderly group are increasing, it's the old, old group, which is 80 years old or above. Uh, they are even expanding this population. So uh, we have to prepare uh, to take care of this group. This group may have a very different uh, illness trajectory with the uh, current uh, 60 or 70 uh, age group. So we need to uh, be prepared. Now, another issue is the aging population is increasing uh, to 31.9% in 2038. Now, but at the same time, the elderly support ratio is decreasing because we have fewer children, the younger generation are uh, in smaller in size. So the bigger the elderly population, the smaller the uh, younger generation turns out to have a much uh, lower elderly support ratio. And uh, the medium age of the population is also increasing. So uh, the, the younger, the more energetic, more uh, workable group will be uh, smaller. Now, another concept I also want to uh, introduce from the United Nations, which had to bring us some ideas is the so-called uh, life expectancy and the healthy life expectancy. Now, the good news is we are dying much older and older, but we have to take note that the healthy life expectancy is more important. I have been talking to a lot of older adults and they actually said that they don't need a long life, they need a healthy life. So what they want 
is uh, they can be able to move, they can take care of themselves when they were at the final uh, days of their life. So uh, you can see that the gaps uh, is about nine years of healthy life. So uh, probably during this period of time, more attention and care we have to. And then at the final time when they have the uh, uh, incurable disease, the care will be more, even more intense. So this is the world trend, this is the international trend, and so is in Hong Kong. Now, going back to Hong Kong, uh, I mentioned about the structure of the family. Now, this is something we are also very worrying, is uh, we are now having about uh, 13 percent of elderly, they live alone. And uh, there is another group who are staying together, two elderly staying together without their children, without any other people is 25.2%. Now this is the statistics in 2016, but you can see uh, increasing trend. Now we expect uh, the one in 2021 will even be much, much uh, 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 higher because the population is now entering into the aging uh, cohort and uh, Thinking about if they are living alone, if they are living with an older adult, when we want them to have community care, what can be done? Can the spouse take care of them? Can who can be taking care of those who live alone? So these are the question and they had to depend on the uh, government institution. Now, but unfortunately the government institution are much far more uh, a delay in all the meeting the demands because uh, the, the speed of growing is much larger than the speed of building the, all this institution. So this is another challenge we are facing. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Lancet Commission report actually points us to more direction and more uh, expansion. And uh, in the report, there is a chapter talking about social, psycho, spiritual care. Uh, I think this also reflect by the audience. Earlier on, a lot of questions to Dr. Raymond Lowe are related to the uh, psychosocial spiritual dimension. So you are all aware that uh, patients in their end of life is not challenged only by the healthcare uh, challenge, but also the psychosocial spiritual. Now, but you can see from the report uh, of Lancet, uh, in, at that time, they focus mainly on the physical, but the psychological one and also the uh, social spiritual one is less uh, uh, mention, but they also found that uh, the needs are there. They actually found that uh, about 39% of the population they analyze uh, do have psychological symptoms. Now it is just slightly lower than the physical symptoms and comp composing with social symptoms, composing with uh, 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 spiritual symptoms, you can see that the need will be quite expanding. So what am I going to do? I keep on telling you we have a difficult time. The world is demanding their challenge. What can be, we do? Now, we are thinking of expansion. If the demand is expansion, the supply had also be expand. But how can we expand our supply. And uh, one thing is to expand uh, the place of care. So uh, right now, I, I do think that we have a good hospital care and you can see from the uh, uh, quality of death index, uh, Hong Kong quality of end of life care is very good. But uh, when we talk about community part, now this is the part that we can further expand. And also we cannot rely totally on professionals. Uh, first of all, they need training and also they need the uh, salary and uh, the uh, budget will not be strong enough to cover a lot of uh, professionals. Now, but one key point is not only, not only about money, it is about the matching of needs. Some uh, patients and family. Actually, they don't need very uh, sophisticated or uh, professional input. Uh, maybe volunteers or maybe some knowledge and skills can already be okay to elevate their sufferings. So 
probably uh, we had to expand our providers from professionals to family members, to volunteers, and also to the other community groups. And uh, if the needs are multidimensional, then uh, we can't expect uh, everyone can have all the multiple levels of uh, competence and talent. And a multidisciplinary team or interdisciplinary team more appropriately uh, will be helpful because we can then uh, exert our expertise in our discipline uh, to meet the individual needs of the families and the patients. So uh, talking about the challenge, then let's go to the international context before we move back to Hong Kong. So uh, starting from 2014, uh, this is a very uh, special moment when the WHO uh, members actually uh, call for the strengthening of palliative care as a component of comprehensive care. And it is it was uh, stated clearly in the 67 World Health Assembly. So a lot of time we refer to this and show it to the government and hope that uh, they remember this is an international call. Now, but other than that, you can also see uh, before that in 2013, uh, scholar already highlight that community-based palliative care is a natural evolution probably they are also going through the same in a grand challenge. And then they understand that uh, providing care in uh, the hospital or mainly by the hospital team may not be able to meet all the needs. So it is a, nation, uh, a natural evolution to expand it to the community. And uh, in 2015, uh, the European group already uh, prepared a manual helping us, uh, helping those who want to set up community palliative care project. And then uh, this is a report and also with a lot of recommendation uh, that uh, the others can borrow from the European Association. And uh, another person who spent a lot of his time to promote this concept is uh, Professor Alan Kalika. And he had been to Hong Kong uh, to join in 2017, you can see from the picture, um, joining one of our international conference. And uh, he actually highlighted a concept called compassionate communities. And uh, I like the statement very much. He actually said, end of life care is everyone's responsibility. So to some extent, this is true. So how we can tap in everyone's uh, participation is the key point we are going to discuss in the uh, next part of our presentation. And then uh, people also highlight that building community in the com uh, building capacity in the community is an urgent need because uh, if we relied on medically driven model of palliative care, then uh, we won't be able to meet the needs. I think they are quite similar argument. Now, I also want to bring to you the uh, UK national framework, uh, which also give us a lot of ideas to move on. Uh, they propose six ambitions to bring uh, visions. Uh, I do think uh, in the afternoon, uh, Professor Biwi will also talk about this one. So I will, skip, uh, I will just uh, uh, skip it and not uh, go into it in details. Now, what I want to focus on is point four and point six. Now, one point that they mentioned is a lot of time, a lot of people are providing palliative care, but if the care is not well coordinated, then maybe there are duplication of surface, maybe we are meeting uh, some needs and we are overlooking some gaps. So uh, the UK framework highlight that it is important to have a good coordinated care and it is about shared record. It is about a very clear role delineation between different parties and uh, it should be a system-wide uh, project and uh, we had to have a partnership in the continuation and everyone is involved. And the point six is a uh, point five, uh, actually three point, 
Form 5 is about capacity building. Uh, we had to make our staff prepare. Not only they have the skills and knowledge, and most important of all is uh, the idea and the values, uh, just as Dr. Raymond Lowe said earlier, respecting the patient, patient center, and also uh, the dignity of the patient. Now, if we uh, don't buy this value, it will be very difficult uh, to carry out palliative care in the uh, population. So that's why uh, we hope that we had individualized uh, competence building program, uh, both to the executive, both to the frontline staff, and uh, with knowledge, and also with uh, continuous support uh, to make sure they are well supported because these tasks are really uh, energy draining. And recently, there are also a new development in use of technology because uh, we have to be more efficient to handle a larger demand. So uh, with the better use of technology, it can help. And lastly, uh, the legislation, the legal system had also be in line. So that's why you can see the government uh, recently are uh, having the consultation on end of life care. And then the first thing that they want to promote is the change in some legal uh, situation. And lastly, um, we hope each community is prepared to help, including bringing public awareness and uh, volunteers, compassion and resilience uh, communities. And at the same time, uh, we address the practical support as well. Now, not only, uh, uh, not only the national uh, framework, uh, the National Council for Palliative Care in UK, they also uh, highlight the importance of community development and bringing up that uh, we are not only training the medical team, we need to build the community. And in Australia, they also talk about uh, the community engagement. And then uh, in some service, it should be and it must be provided by the hospital-based support. Now, but there are places uh, other than hospital, like patients' home, uh, like uh, residential age home, and also uh, places for those with mental illness or uh, someone with uh, disability, and also the correctional facilities like the prisons. Uh, these are all places that death can happen and that should also be well taken care of. And then another report cards, now, this is done by uh, the Lin Feng, uh, sponsored by the Lin Foundation, done by the Economist, and it seems like a, uh, a report card uh, for the uh, end of life care and and death and dying professionals. Now, in two hundred one zero and two hundred one five, they had uh, already carried out twice, and uh, actually this year they are already uh, planning to do the uh, the third one. Uh, there are new innovation in the third one with a more scientific assessment. So, uh, but because of the COVID, uh, the whole process was slightly delayed. Now, but going back to the earlier version, the 2015, and you can actually see that uh, the calculation, uh, just like uh, when I teach in university, we talk about the rubric, how to assess your score. And uh, this is the rubric. And actually 10% is put to community engagement, which means uh, they check whether the volunteers, the community are aware of palliative care, the attitude, uh, these are all counted. Now, uh, in Hong Kong, the score in this dimension is not that uh, uh, desirable in a way. And uh, I do think that this score composed of two ideas, both care in the community with public attitudes and public awareness be counted and also care by the community which is meant by volunteerism and also the social care unit uh, where they can also support the uh, patients with end-of-life care. Now we mentioned Hong Kong is graded 22nd in over 80s uh, places and as I mentioned community uh, engagement score the lowest, and uh, it is nearly in the midpoint. So according to WHO, 
uh, we need to develop the public awareness and also uh, work through the cultural and social barriers uh, of deaf and dying before we can bring end-of-life care to a more visible state. So now I move back to Hong Kong local situation. Now I hope to show you the background before I introduce what we have done in the past five years uh, uh, on in the community. What happened in the local? Now, if you are familiarized with the uh, Hong Kong policy address uh, in 2017, there is actually one statement related to uh, end of life and palliative care. Uh, uh, the government actually aware that uh, measure had to be introduced to provide palliative care and end of life care services for increased number of terminally ill patients and uh, in particular within hospital settings and already highlight that in the community. And then uh, they already uh, propose some direction like home palliative care and also uh, increasing home visit, which they have expanded a, uh, a, a larger number of home care nurses and also uh, the residential care services. And uh, they also talk about legislation related to dying in place. Now in 2018, this statement is still around and they promise to have a consultation in 2019 uh, related to advanced directive and also relevant end of life care. And eventually in 2019, it happens. Uh, uh, but around the same time, the hospital authority in Hong Kong also developed the strategic service framework for palliative care. And you can see point three, uh, it is directly related to uh, ambulatory and community settings uh, to support patients and reduce unnecessary hospitalization. And uh, you can also see that uh, coordination and care in place uh, with support from hospital to community is one of the uh, key features in the future plan. Now, these two are the consultation paper and the consultation report, uh, which published in 2019 and 2020. And you can see that uh, the government uh, will start the uh, wide range of initiative, including the legislation. But at the same time, they are aware that uh, we also had to carry out public education and also uh, uh, end of life and death plannings and the ACP promotions uh, and also care in the RCHES, etc. So you can see that uh, this is already in the agenda of the Hong Kong local government. So this is the background. When we first start off to think about what can we do uh, as an uh, in initiative project. Now I'm very grateful to the Hong Kong Jockey Club Charity Trust uh, who had the vision to support the need of the uh, patients with challenging disease and also their family members. And then we set up uh, the Jockey Club End of Life Community Care Project. Uh, this project I have been working for four years, five years. And maybe uh, let me show you a promotional uh, video so that uh, it will be less boring of just hearing my sound. Ms Ng's father was admitted to an elderly home due to dementia and passed away a year later. As he was approaching his end stage, Ms Ng enrolled him in the Jockey Club End of Life Community Care Project. Aside from having nurses and social workers to follow up on her dad's condition, which reduced his hospital readmissions, he also had the option of passing away in the elderly home rather than having to be rushed to the hospital at the last minute. 我覺得佢俾咗一個選擇我，我可以去諗俾我爸爸
係如果佢有朝一日走嘅時候咧，係可以有尊嚴地走。Her dad passed away in the end-of-life care room of the elderly home. Before he died, Ms. Ng gave her dad some rice water and glucose water to drink after discussion with the nurse. 當然佢冇話俾我聽，但係誒喺我嘅角度咧，即係我都會覺得啊，呢個可能已經滿足到佢，即係佢想食飯呢一樣嘢嚇。咁結果咧，嗰晚佢真係走咗啦。我爸爸最後誒，佢、呃、又咪起落肚，咁亦都因為佢飲咗啲葡萄糖水咧，我諗亦都係中國人所講嘅，就係誒帶住啲甜嘅嘢走。As her father passed away in the end of life care room, Ms. Ng was able to do one last thing for her dad。就係我可以最後幫我爸爸係誒，即係清潔身體嚇。換埋衫嚇，咁先至俾佢離開嗰啲咁嚇。咁我諗呢一樣嘢係對我作為佢個女咧，都係一個我自己好感恩嘅嘢，真係有尊嚴地走咯。喺晚期病患者同屋企人喺醫療同照顧嘅安排上邊有選擇，係非常重要嘅，因為末期病人。喺在世嘅時間都係有限，能夠按照佢哋嘅選擇過多一分有質素嘅生活，對佢同屋企人就留一個更美好嘅時間。Not only does the Jockey Club End of Life Community Care Project serve terminally ill patients in elderly homes, it also provides support to those who wish to receive palliative care at home. End stage patients need a certain degree of medical care. If they choose to receive care outside the hospital, a community network to support their needs is required. Simon was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. As the disease progressed to the terminal stage, his ability to swallow, talk, and move gradually deteriorated. He could no longer take care of his 80-year-old mother in poor health, while he also needed to be cared for. Facing such a situation, like many terminally ill patients, Simon would like to continue staying at home, but it was not easy. To fulfill Simon's wish to be cared for at home, the project nurse paid a home visit to teach his family members various caring skills, such as feeding and lifting. This would help minimize the possibility of getting pneumonia caused by choking. As well as preventing injuries from falling to avoid unnecessary hospital admissions, the project team also assessed Simon's home environment. The occupational therapist recommended home modification by installing some adaptive equipment in his room and bathroom to make his daily life more convenient. <laughs> In addition to practical support, volunteers provided psychosocial care and spiritual support during home visits conducted every two weeks. 中意用下老根嘅嘢，佢好似佢會特登買啲好五明所嗌我哋幫佢搞。後尾就做運打天狗，都係唔老嘅，做做運動嘅咁做下做筋帶啊，同埋啊呢個練筋棒啊咁。呢啲嘅什麼嘢，什麼什麼什麼嘅呢啲啊？晚期病患者除咗需要關注身體嘅狀況之外咧，佢哋嘅心理健康都好重要㗎。喺熟悉嘅環境，同屋企人一齊，有助穩定晚期病患者嘅情緒，對患者本人同屋企人都有好處噶。當好多家庭去面對屋企人喺離世之前嗰段短啲嘅時間咧，佢係唔知點樣處理，甚至係啲專業嘅人士，譬如社工啊，甚至啲醫務人員咧，都係需要喺呢一方面咧去累積佢嘅經驗。當政府未係真係去進行有關嘅工作嘅時候，馬會就幫到我哋有一個先導先試嘅作用
今次呢個安寧仲係能夠令到嗰啲嘅基礎係做好。咁日後當我哋更加廣泛去推行嘅時候，政府去考慮係咪可以成為佢恆常嘅工作咧，係會有好大嘅幫助嘅。賽馬會安寧仲計劃一開始已經聯合社福同埋醫療政策部門，包括食物及衛生局、勞工及福利局。社會福利處、醫管局同埋社福機構為計劃提供建議同埋方向。計劃推行到而家，已經同全港十三間醫院建立緊密嘅聯繫。另外有超過三千七百位嘅病患者同家屬受惠。過程之中收集嘅數據同埋經驗，為政府將來喺香港推行安寧服務提供咗重要嘅參考。我哋都希望透過專業人士嘅培訓同埋公眾教育活動。等晚期病患者了解，并且喺充分知情之下，作出合适嘅临终护理选择，提升佢哋嘅晚期生活质素。This is a promotion, but uh, this was produced in 2018. So uh, we haven't taken into account uh, the impact of COVID and uh, it is not covering the second phase of our project. Now, for those who are in Hong Kong who might be familiarized with this project, but uh, I still want to introduce this briefly for those who have uh, little information about the project. Now, as you can see from the diagram, uh, our project uh, is targeted at four levels. The first level is more related to knowledge and skills building, and we targeted the general public and hope that uh, they are more aware of the service and the needs of their neighbors who are suffering from end-of-life uh, needs. And the second level is uh, to provide service for uh, patients and family at the uh, community through four NGOs, uh, which include Haven of Hope and uh, Society for Rehab, uh, Holy Carpenter, and also St. James Settlement. And at the same time, uh, you see from the very beginning of the video, uh, it was a case in a residential care home. And uh, this is a project uh, lead by uh, Dr. Edward, uh, Edwin Le uh, Edward Learn uh, with the uh, Hong Kong Association of Geri Gerontology. And lastly, uh, CUHK uh, is also one of our partners and then they focus on the healthcare professionals uh, uh, in the hospital, uh, the capacity building. Now going back to the cases, I think you can see some uh, challenge we are working on. Like in every culture, we have our own cultural belief. So uh, even some experience overseas may not be totally applicable uh, to transfer to Hong Kong. Now, as you can learn from the cases, uh, eating something related to sweet uh, sweetness and uh, having some rice or, or rice water had a cultural implication for the family and it had a lasting uh, uh, effect. So uh, we do need more exchanges in the uh, local knowledge and competence because these are very important and but it is culturally laden. Now, and also, uh, Dr. Leung also mentioned that we need to offer patient choices if they want to care at home or if they want to care at the uh, RCHE, uh, these are their choices. Now, I do think this is extremely important because end-of-life patients always had a feeling that they have no choice. Uh, they can't control uh, when to die, they can't control uh, their physical mobility, and they had multiple losses. So if we can offer them some feasible choices, at least they can exercise their autonomy. This will make them a little bit balanced. So uh, I still remember when I was working as a medical social worker, uh, we often uh, try to talk to patients by giving them some choices like, do you want to eat dinner right now? Or an hour later, do you want to have, uh, uh, what kind of food do you want to have? Now, so these are the more manageable tasks, but still when patient had a sense of control and had a sense of exercising their 
choices, and that is already uh, having a, a positive impact on the psychological level of the patient. So uh, I do think that autonomy and choices is one of the key points in uh, taking care of patients with end of life needs. And uh, from the case of Sam's, uh, 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 from the case of the old man, you see, the mother is still surviving. And this picture is a common situation in Hong Kong. Sometimes the old old may not be the one who is the patient, but the child who is a young old uh, is the patient. And so you can imagine how complicated uh, the care it is. And uh, you also see that we motivate uh, volunteers to join in this mission. Now, when the volunteers are joining the activities, uh, you can see that the patient are being distracted their attention from their illness to something enjoyable. Now, this short-term uh, distraction actually had a good psychological impact. And uh, uh, when the patient can put their illness, their symptoms aside from their mind and focusing in their uh, different activities, uh, that is helpful. Now, but at the same time, it is good for the volunteers as well. It gives them a chance to see life is like this. Uh, one day we will also face the end of life and then uh, it is not so bad at the end of life they can still talk they can still enjoy their life so this is a much better education program than we uh, use our video or whatever so uh, at that time in the first three years uh, we actually had the NGOs trying different models. Now, because at that time, we don't know what is the best uh, way to provide service for patients and families. So uh, we collaborate with five NGOs and each NGOs had their unique features. Now for Haven of Hope, you will know that uh, they had a very good medical team and also a good spiritual team. So they focus on uh, taking care of patients who have uh, medical and also spiritual needs. And in particular, they are promoting uh, advanced care planning because their team has doctors and nurses. And then St. James Settlement, uh, the team also had a good team of volunteers and uh, the staff are relatively young and they like to bring joy to the family. So they use another model by uh, creating positive time, good time for the family by playing different kinds of games uh, and let the family to have a sense of support. So uh, they don't do a lot on other stuff, but they spend more time in facilitating the families uh, to have activities together to enjoy their time together. Now for society or for rehab, you know they are more uh, uh, expertise, uh, they have more expertise in uh, strengthening patient self-empowerment. So their model uh, working on a group which is non-cancer group and to help the patients to learn some simple uh, techniques in uh, working through their own symptoms. It encouraged the patients to have more self-management. And then for Holy Carpenter, uh, they are having good repetition in mobilizing volunteers. So this group, uh, they work on using volunteer support and see how it will support the team. And lastly, uh, the Hong Kong Association of Gerontology, uh, they are mainly targeted with the elderly residential service and uh, they train up the staff, they provide coaching for the staff and hope that uh, the patient can stay longer at the RCHE if they wish to. So these are the five models. Now can you have a guess which model is more superior? Because at that time, this is the tough job uh, offered by the Jockey Club. They asked us, Hong Kong U, to do the evaluation and to see which model is better and then uh, try to have a second phase to work on the second model. Now, so it is very political, so no one wants to show the answer. Now, uh, in reality, we found that every organization, every model, they have their own unique contribution. And at the same time, 
we also found that patient they are actually having a very different needs and so maybe i i will share with you more about uh, the result so we uh, use a, a more systematic framework uh, to assess the outcome uh, we include the input activities, output, outcome, and impact. And we uh, use interviews uh, to collect qualitative data. We also use a uh, questionnaire survey to co collect uh, the quantitative data from both the patients and the families. And then uh, we want to see what are the outcomes and impact. Now, these are the output first. Uh, we have eventually offered uh, surface to 5,002 uh, patients and family members. Now, this is the first phase. This is the first three years of numbers. And then uh, these are the capacity building numbers and also the public education numbers. And uh, maybe you are more interested in the direct surface. So uh, I will be focusing on the direct surface. We eventually, uh, out of the uh, 2,000 families, we can only uh, get the full data from 777 uh, patients and also a few hundred of family members. Uh, we have majority of our patients referred by the hospital authorities and uh, about a quarter, uh, one, about 14% are from other social services agency. And uh, because of the public education program, we also receive self-referrals uh, from individuals. But then we will link up back uh, to the hospital, the doctors, uh, the medical team, the host team that they are taking care of the patients. And uh, you can see from our data, majority of them are from with cancer, but we also take into uh, some like renal failure and also the COPD patient uh, like this. And uh, after the assessment, even though our intervention are uh, offered in line of psychosocial dimension, now you can see that about uh, 80% of the physical symptoms are reduced and it is to the statistical significant level. Depression, anxiety is also decreased. Uh, practical problems are also decreased. Now, one thing that I want to highlight is this group are going downhill physically. Actually, at the first stage of our project, we only admitted patients with six months uh, uh, prognosis. So that means uh, they are expected to die in a bit, about a few months. So in the last six months, their physical health is expected to go downhill. But uh, with the intervention, with the support, we actually found that uh, the physical symptoms are reducing rather than increasing. And uh, at the same time, the caregiver strength, uh, the anxiety, and also uh, the intimacy, the relationship with the patients are also going in the right direction with statistical significance. So these are the more specific uh, uh, ideas to show to you. We use IPOS uh, as the measurements and uh, these are the outcome. As we, also, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the summation of the physical symptoms had a drop of 18%. Uh, as for the specific symptoms, including pain, uh, shortness of breath and weakness, uh, you can see it drops about uh, one quarter or one sixth. About the emotions, uh, you can see that the depression and anxiety dropped significantly and uh, the practical needs are also dropped. Probably they are met by uh, the provision of our workers and the volunteers. And as for the family, family members, uh, which someone also mentioned, they are the uh, care unit of us. And uh, the family anxiety and also caregiving burden and also family relationship are also improve and the negative one are decreases. 
And uh, another important statistics that we want to is to understand whether the uh, healthcare utilization uh, changes. Now, this is commonly adopted by the uh, community end of life care evaluation in internationally. So that's why we also take in these uh, variables for our analysis. Like you can see that the length of state uh, is reduced. But what we are comparing is we have the honor to get the data of hospital authority uh, that the patient who died in 2015. And then we pick out all the elderly patient, which is the same group as our service recipient. And uh, the major, uh, with a major diagnosis of cancer, renal failure, heart failure, and also uh, the neurological disease. And then we compare the average length of stay in the last six months with our service recipient. And then we found that there is a drop of 12.5% uh, of length of stay in the acute and convalescence ward and uh, the usage of uh, A&E is also reduced and also the ICU bed uh, is also reduced. Now, even though you see uh, a few days, doesn't, doesn't, you see a few days, it doesn't mean a lot. Now, but if you uh, use the calculation, uh, if we have, uh, we, we serve 777 patients, and then uh, calculate by uh, the days, the difference. And you can see we actually save 3,784 days, hospital days for other patients. Now that means 10 more years of hospital beds. And the intensive care unit, we also save 62 days. And uh, the A and E visit, it also reduced by 2.49. Now, we now serve a smaller population group of 777. If this number is expanded, uh, probably uh, the uh, service that can be uh, available for other patients will be even larger. And also remember, this is our teething period. This is the first three years of our project and we are not good in our intervention at that time. And uh, recently, because we uh, refined our intervention models, the staff are more proficient in carrying out their care. And then the number is increasing, the savings, which I means is increasing. And uh, talking about the satisfaction, and you can see that the patients and the families are showing appreciation to our service. And uh, we also uh, conduct a survey with our stakeholders, including the referrers. And uh, you can see that uh, the feedback are also very positive. And uh, as you see from the earlier discussion, we are not only testing and providing the uh, direct service, we need to provide a, a training concept and a, a proposal a curriculum. And actually another arm of our project are spending time to develop end of life care competence in social, psychosocial care. And we postulate based on the literature of other models uh, around the world, and also our uh, contact with the different expert teams, uh, we propose seven domain of training that include uh, psychosocial spiritual care, end of life care decision, communications, and uh, basic knowledge and overarching values, and uh, also self-care and self-reflection, uh, bereavement care, and also uh, physical symptoms management. Now we actually developed a scale uh, to for assessment and for measurement, and it just published, it just come out uh, in the palliative and support care. And uh, we use the scale to assess uh, the changes of the general pop, uh, professionals. Now, uh, these are not all the uh, professionals who receive our training. These are the general one. Uh, you can see that uh, they have some form of improvement. Yeah, but the whole sample are more on the uh, level six or level seven but you can see that for the whole sample, self-care is much higher. So good that uh, we are still taking good care of ourselves. 
So uh, in the past, uh, in the first three years, we have offered a two one year leadership training program. And also we have run a lot of professional training uh, projects uh, as suggested by the uh, UK national framework. We need to engage the stakeholders and we also arrange the executive forums uh, with international speakers and to communicate with the uh, key leaders. And uh, you can also see that uh, our training program, uh, the professionals are having a are generally quite high satisfaction levels. And the learning also improved their competence. And uh, you can see that uh, the overall improvement in the pre and post uh, training situation, uh, the overall competence had a significant change of 22%. And uh, in the leadership training, because this is a year long program, uh, the leaders actually had a much greater uh, change in their competence in different dimension, as well as their uh, so called the leadership skills. And uh, these are the dimensions you can see uh, uh, the baseline of the training with the uh, uh, out with the uh, final post test training. Now, but not worthily is some of our training just lasts for two uh, two session or maybe uh, at most four session. So, but still, uh, in particular, the knowledge related to community end of life care support end of life uh, decision making and symptom management. And you can see there is a significant changes. So aside from the professional one, we have the public education and uh, we use different media like uh, a mini movie, we produce a game card, we produce books, and we also uh, have the conference, including the international conference, engage a much larger population. And uh, the mini movie is put on site and we also arrange uh, some talks uh, related to these mini movies and the books. And at the same time, volunteers is one of the key uh, uh, driver in our service as well. So uh, our volunteer team led by Dr. Vivian Lau, uh, she developed a screening tools for volunteers development because volunteers for general uh, service and volunteers for end of life care is slightly different. Uh, the emotional level and uh, the ability to stand on uh, facing the death of patient is something challenging for uh, a normal uh, volunteers. So uh, they need to screen and they need to offer substantial training and on ongoing support and supervision in order to make sure they can fulfill their role without doing harm to the families. And then uh, they trained uh, 91 volunteers in the first three years. And uh, you can see that uh, the effect are uh, also quite uh, positive. And uh, these are the dimension of the training, but uh, it is more drastic in the training. Uh, after the training, uh, it still lasts uh, for some time and the competence did not drop. And you can see that uh, these are the project impact. Uh, they also published a paper on the effectiveness uh, also just recently. So just in case if you are interested, uh, do go to visit uh, the research on social work practice and you will know more about the effectiveness of the volunteers training program. Now, so from the three years, how are we moving towards uh, the uh, second phase of our project? Now in 2018, our service end the first phase and uh, uh, the Jockey Club Charity Trust actually want to extend the project because they really want to see how we can find a, a, a integrated model and to uh, provide a standardized uh, intervention. Now, based on the findings in the first three years from the four NGOs, we built a new concept called ISAC, called the Integrated Community End of Life Support Team. And uh, we built on the lessons learned from the three, uh, uh, the four NGOs, uh, we, we actually found that every patient and every families 
have very individualized need. And we cannot use one size fits all intervention. So that's why this ISAT model is a need based approach. And then uh, we keep on working on it. And up to uh, last year end, uh, we already provide service uh, to 1,200 uh, patients. And then up to uh, earlier this year, we also increased our number like this. And we keep on revising our model. And actually this model come to the 3.0 version right now. But uh, because we are still working on the data, I think we will grab other opportunities to share about uh, the 3.0 in future. So again, maybe you are tired of my sharing. So it's a time to show you another video about uh, the achievement and the transition from the first phase to the second phase. Over the past three years, the project has benefited more than 5,000 patients and their family members who palliative care, psychosocial and spiritual support. As a result, many elderly and their families are able to make much more informed and uh, better choices. We hope that uh, the government efforts, uh, including the Food and Health Bureau and also the Hospital Authority, uh, to line up the different efforts or initiatives so that the end of life care can be in a much comprehensive uh, structure. With a strong collaboration between the faculty and our other project partners, we believe the project will help fill service gaps in end of life care in Hong Kong and provide useful models for the community and government policy decision making. Three, two, one, open. project will be expanded to 48 uh, residential care elderly homes and we are going to develop the uh, ISAT model, the integrated model which are used by four NGOs together. We want to standardize our training program by introduce classroom, flip classroom learning. We will utilize online training. Ho 我們相信我們這個服務是朝向一個適合的方向去滿足長者和末期病患者的需要的。You and I have a responsibility today and in the years ahead to change the community conversation. And we need to foster those conversations across our community. The JCECCP is doing that, but we need to magnify that. So I will spend the remaining time talking more about the clinical part, uh, which you might also be interested. Uh, so uh, the ISAT model, volume one, volume two, volume three, is talking about the importance of a cycle, which we need to identify the right person to receive the service. And then after receiving it, uh, the uh, referrals, uh, we need to do a more uh, accurate assessment uh, in order to uh, to plan our intervention and then intervene. But this is a cycle. Uh, we need to have continuous assessment. So that is the idea. This is borrowed from the UK uh, Golden Framework. And uh, according to our analysis, 
patients and families who are in end of life, who are in the community, most of the time they have three types of needs, uh, including physical. They, they will still complain about some physical symptoms, but at the same time, they start to subtly share some psychosocial concern, like uh, how am I going to uh, relate with my daughter? We have some unfinished business. Uh, we have some argument. We want a reconciliation and something maybe they want to do together as a family or maybe they have something they want to share among themselves, but find it very difficult to start off. So these are all the possible psychosocial uh, sharing. And at the same time, they will also have some physical, uh, spiritual question, like where am I going to go? Am I doing something wrong? So right now I have to suffer. So, so these are all the challenge questions uh, raised by patients, now, but no, individuals are the same so and also they put up the question at a very different phase and time so we need a uh, assessment we need to uh, have a multi-dimensional assessment with patients and carers and at the same time uh, we also this project had a very unique features of keep on doing outcome evaluation to see whether the things are working because we don't want to waste our uh, resources and time of the patient as well. So we have developed uh, assessment tools. Uh, uh, you can imagine patients in the end of life are having very limited energy. So we don't want to uh, occupy a, a four pages, 10 pages questionnaire for them to, uh, to make them feel upset. We use a very simple uh, tools like using the internationally adopted IPOS uh, scale. And now we are going through the uh, validation Chinese version. And I hope we can also help uh, to develop a standardized uh, measures for the future uh, assessment. And uh, we also use uh, online platform so that uh, after filling in the uh, score and actually it will generate an outcome and indication of uh, how the patients and family are uh, at that point and that will help us to understand what are the major needs of the families and the patient so uh, we are using a real-time assessment and using a short questionnaire so if we find that uh, the score is not very high, then we try ask the need uh, to volunteers or, or a lower uh, level of intervention. Now, but if we found that they have extremely high needs, like in psychosocial, then immediately we will arrange our social workers uh, to, to offer some support or in a very special occasion, if they even need more specialist input, uh, we will negotiate and see whether we, we can make further referrals. So this is based on need assessment and uh, differentiate those who are having high needs and low needs and then arrange uh, uh, the service accordingly. And then at the same time, our team had also did uh, uh, some literature review with the evidence-based clinical practice. Uh, in recent years, uh, in UK and also in Australia, they developed some protocol related to end-of-life psychosocial intervention. So uh, we aggregate the information together with the uh, uh, randomized controlled trial studies and the uh, meta-analysis studies and to find what are the targeted evidence intervention for a specific uh, symptoms. So we make a menu uh, uh, based on all the literature review. So uh, you look at it, it is very complicated. Uh, it seems like we had the logic model uh, to talk about what are the symptoms, if the symptoms is high, and then uh, it will generate some practical tips from the uh, systematic review of what kind of intervention may be benefit. So uh, this is the logic model, but it is all inputted into a computer program. So when the uh, staff go to visit the patient, when they do the assessment, when the score is uh, calculated, and then some ideas uh, of recommendation of intervention will come out automatically to help the staff to make a much uh, easier decision. Now, but of course, I'm not saying that we use uh, 
uh, AI to rep uh, to replace the clinical expertise of the staff, but this is just uh, assisted uh, uh, support. Uh, clinical uh, assessment is equally important, but this will help to have a uh, uh, better, uh, a quicker uh, reminders and uh, offer as some complementary information only. Now. Uh, when we mentioned earlier that we don't want to have duplication of surface, so this is our model. Uh, currently, before our services uh, start off, patient, when they are at home, when they go to the hospital, when they are uh, having a prognosis of less than 12 months and some psychosocial indication, uh, some needs of psychosocial care. And then uh, they will either be discharged back home or they will go to the palliative care unit first before they go back home. Now, but uh, there are barriers of receiving support from the existing healthcare and psychosocial care surface uh, because we have a great demand and also the waiting list usually is long. And we also heard that patients find it uh, difficult to find the transportation to directly go back to the hospital for daycare and also the uh, outpatient. Even though ambulance service is available, but they need a long time to make the booking. Maybe they need to wait a long time in the, uh, uh, in the settings. So what we are doing is we have no intention to uh, overlap with the other surface. We just hope that in the interim period, when they are still on the waiting list, when they are not yet ready to receive the surface from the uh, existing surface, uh, the ISAT team is filling in the gaps uh, to provide service. Now, since they have a short expectancy of life of 12 months, and if we can fill in the gaps before they receive the formal service, that might be helping uh, the patients and families a lot. Uh, sometimes patients actually said because of the long waiting list, uh, they die before they actually receive the service. So that is the reason why we think uh, the ISAC team is important. So uh, we have very good communications with our hospitals and we develop uh, standardized referral forms to make sure we have a clear expectation of, uh, of our uh, cases. And at the same time, we have designed some very simple form for uh, uh, continuous communications, but you can see it is very brief and uh, we hope not to uh, waste the time of the uh, healthcare professional in the hospital. And from time to time, uh, the uh, NGOs team will also join the regular meetings or case conference with the uh, parent hospital team in order to have more exchange of ideas. So I also hope that kind of collaboration can be modeled after. And then we have a clear role delineation between the hospital staff and also our uh, team staff. And uh, we just want to make sure there is no gap and seamless care. So aside from direct service, uh, in the second phase, we also carry out our uh, different training program. And as you heard from the video, we have our online using a flipped classroom concept uh, to teach about the psychosocial uh, spiritual care in end of life. Uh, we have the uh, basic module, intermediate module, and then the advanced module. And at the same time, we have some domain specific and also setting specific training. And uh, this year, we also start off our leadership training uh, for a year off and we recruit about 30 uh, potential leaders in of the future. And these are the flipped classroom ideas. The basic course is totally online, but for the intermediate one, we have tutorials, we have workshops, and for the advanced one, we also have the uh, online training, but also tutorial. And all the uh, attendants, they need uh, to attend uh, the assessment, and also they need to uh, join the uh, MCQ in order to make sure uh, they uh, achieve the levels. So, uh, these are the training program we are carry on. So in case if you are interested, please visit our website. And this is the online training program, the link. So uh, for the final seven minutes, I would like to share a little bit about my vision towards future. Recently, I think every one of you heard about New Zealand. They approved 
uh, they legalize euthanasia. And also in Canada and Australia and some part of Australia, uh, uh, assisted dying had been legalized. So these actually ring a bell to us. Uh, I think I'm not opposing uh, everyone to exert their autonomy. But one thing that I want to highlight is, are they offering enough choices in caring their needs? So uh, before they decide euthanasia, before they decide assisted dying, are they offering adequate care, adequate choices in handling their symptoms, both emotional, psychological, spiritual, and physical? So I, I do think uh, as uh, healthcare professionals or social care professionals, we need to do something uh, or, 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 or not to uh, go to the easiest way to legalize uh, the euthanasia and also the uh, the uh, assisted dying. But this is not an easy uh, answer because uh, end of life needs are complicated and it needs a creative and sophisticated solutions and we need everyone participation. So borrowing uh, the idea of Alan Kalika, it's everyone's responsibility. So at the end, I would like to refer you to the Australian Palliative Care National Framework. And uh, they also adopt Alan Halika Compassionate Community Concept. So when we have to provide uh, end-of-life care in the community, it is not only about the direct service. We also need to develop the community, uh, the skills, uh, the values, and also we need to build partnership. Uh, it is not only uh, social care services. We also need to partner with churches. We also need to partner with university, school, or even business uh, company. And uh, in order to make our network much stronger in order to support such a great need. And at the same time, we also need awareness raising, and to a certain point, we need to do some advocacy work uh, uh, to, uh, to the policy and also to the uh, community uh, activation. So uh, it is not an easy task and everyone's uh, contribution will count. And uh, as they said, uh, it is not only the individuals and not only the healthcare system, uh, civil institution, businesses, union, community organization, and eventually the governments are all stakeholders of the compassionate community. I hope before I retire, I can see uh, the development of compassionate community in a small region in Hong Kong as a start off. So this is the last slide. Uh, what image do you catch from this. Will you remember this Chinese saying, the sunset is magnificent, but dust is near. Now this picture is actually taken after a home visit of a patient in a public estate in the southern area. I still remember this scene matched so well with the cases. Even though they are receiving, they are at the end of life, the patient's life seems to be very rich and he actually had a good review of their life. So I want to change this common saying. Instead of I hope we can put the order a little bit different. Even though our patient is in the final stage, I hope each of us can pay a role in making their life richer, just like the uh, motto of the Society of Promotion of Hospice Care. They say, when days cannot add to life, add life to days. So lastly, can I appeal to you for something? Uh, we actually is launching a fourth wave of professional survey. So in case if you are a healthcare professional who had been a uh, chance to see patients with end of life needs, please join our studies. And hopefully we can uh, have more data to help us to develop our education program and build a stronger community in supporting end of life care. So that's all for my presentation and may I pass the time back to uh, the moderator.